Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve la akibetu lil muttaqin. Ve la udvane illa ala zalimin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain. Ve men tabi'ahu bi ihsanin ila yevmiddin. Subhaneke la ilme lana illa ma'allamtana inneke entel alimul hakim. Subhaneke la fehme lana illa ma fehemtena inneke entel cevadul kerim. Rabbi şrah li sadri ve yassir li emri vahlul uqdeten min lisani yafqahu qawli ve ufavvidu emri ila Allah inna Allah'a basirun bil ibad. Allahumma salli salaten kamileten ve sellem selamen tamma على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به الوقد وتنفرج به الكرب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتم ويستسقى الغمام بوجهه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا ربي يسر ولا تعسر ربي تمم الخير ربي زدني علما وفهما والحقنا بالصالحين يا حي يا قيوم يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ودعاء لا يسمع وعمل لا يرفع ونفس لا تشبع ربي زدني علما وفهما والحقنا بالصالحين يا حي يا قيوم يا حي يا قيوم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك استغيث لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My respected brothers and very dear sisters and all those Muslims who are watching us welcome to a two-day pre-Ramadan refresher course organized by the Kerberg Islamic Center. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to complete it with khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to maximize the benefit from this particular course so that we are prepared to enter into Ramadan inshallah by next week and our hearts are so filled with excitement that the Ramadan is around the corner. Why this course and for whom this particular course? Muslims, those who know their fiqh, they have learned their rules and they are practicing Muslims regularly. There is no problem. This course is just a refresher for them if they want to. But mainly for youth in particular, young Muslims who are not very practicing and yet when it comes to Ramadan they want to experience Ramadan they become very spiritual they become very practicing Muslim they try to reconnect with the deen with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Quran through fasting through prayers through taraweeh through attending the masajid but many of them do not know the ahkam the rules and regulations, fiqhi rules and regulations of fasting. So this, this particular course, inshallah, today and tomorrow, is designed for such people. We have structured this particular course in two parts. The first part is, inshallah, we will talk about motivators of Ramadan, general virtues, the merits of Ramadan, fasting in particular. And this will spiritually motivate you. So we will dedicate perhaps next two hours or so on Ramadan. We will not touch the rules, ahkam of Ramadan. Maybe in the last hour after Maghrib, that means for the next two hours we will continue. At 7.30 we will stop for Maghrib and come back and resume inshallah after 30 minutes at 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock we will try to finish everything that we have designed 
for today, prepared for tonight. Then comes tomorrow, we will continue with the technical knowledge, do's and don'ts, what is acceptable, what is forbidden, what breaks your siyam, fasting, what does not, what necessitates expiation, kafara, what does not. There, there are some nitty-gritty uh, the rules that we must all be aware of. But if you think that you already know, you can enjoy doing something else or just join our class for the barakah, inshallah ta'ala. This is, this is the plan and we want to continue and see what happens. Our intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. We want to do the right things by Islam, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by our fiqh, that we want to do things rightly. If you just enter into Ramadan without any preparation and you might do some mistakes without even knowing and your fasting could be broken and if you don't respect Ramadan in such manner that you might even suffer the consequences in your spiritual heart, in your spiritual life. So inshallah, let's start. Ramadan fasting immediately associated with these two. Ramadan means a month of spirituality, month of fasting. Fasting in many sense of the word. Fasting in the month of Ramadan became an obligation, compulsory upon the Muslims, a fard upon the Muslims during the second year of Hijrah. When Nabi Sallallahu migrated from Mecca to Medina, that means for 13 years in Mecca period, there was no fard fasting. But as soon as they moved to Medina, established the Islamic State, where the Muslims became, uh, they had their own land, they had their own state, so to speak. Then after two years, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made fasting a fard with the following ayah from the Qur'an in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah, the largest surah of the Qur'an. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina aman, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, all those who claim to have iman in their hearts, fasting is prescribed written upon you as it was written upon those before you it was a command it's made it was a command for the people before you other ummats other nations other followers of the other prophets and including you including you لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so that you may inculcate taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your hearts. You see, many a times in the Qur'an or in our books when a prohibition or a command comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to do something becomes fard for us it is just a command do this establish salat give zakat these are commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however this ayah is quite fascinating from this perspective of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the reason for this particular command Yes, it's been prescribed unto you and the nations before you so that you may inculcate taqwa. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can inculcate taqwa, God-fearing, piety, God-consciousness. English has many translations of this word, but none of them really, really uh, does the truth. But uh, as a Muslim, we should know the word taqwa. Taqbo means when you are in control, you're controlling your nafs, 
When you are tempted with haram, you say stop to your nafs. You keep away from that haram. That's ittiqa. That's taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says through fasting, one month of spiritual training in taqwa, you will strengthen your skill set of abstinence from harams. During the month of Ramadan, as we all know, we have to be abstained from during the daytime, the fasting hours, that we cannot eat, we cannot drink, we cannot smoke, we cannot indulge in uh, our sexual desires with our spouses. So these are halal things, not the smoking though. There are those three things, eating, drinking, and the carnal desire, satisfaction of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us how to control ourselves because we are fasting, not the, the halal things that we normally do becomes prohibited for us, haram for us during the daytime because we are fasting. So it is teaching us self-control. So once, once we leave Ramadan, once we go outside the Ramadan, that because, because we had one month of training, so when we actually see serious harams and we say hold on I know what to do like when I was fasting I can control myself imagine that I am fasting I will not fall into the trap of the shaitan alayhi lana so I will exercise taqwa then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues ayyaman ma'dudat for a certain number of days it's limited days. It is not for the whole year or the whole life. Just limited number of days. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينٍ فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ وَأَنْ تَصُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ Ta'lamun. For a number of, certain number of days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but whoever amongst you fast for a certain number of days, the whole of Ramadan, but whoever amongst you is sick or in safar, in a journey, according to Sharia, then he shall fast a like number of other days, make qada of them, those missed days. And those who are not able to do it may effect a redemption by feeding a poor man. You have to give fitya if you cannot fast due to some serious illness, certified chronic disease. Feeding a poor man. So whoever does not, whoever does good spontaneously, it is better for him and that you fast you're there, but that you fast is better for you if you know. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. Shahru Ramadan al-lazhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an huda lil-nasi wa bayinatim min al-huda wal-furqan faman shahida minkum al-shahra fal yasum wa man kana maridan aw ala safarin فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا تَأْتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَذَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ The month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in which was revealed the Holy Qur'an. A guidance for mankind and a clear proof for the guidance and also a criterion between right and wrong. So whoever of you cites the crescent of the first night of month of Ramadan, that is, if they are present at that time at his home, not traveling, he must observe psalm, fasting of the month. And whoever is ill, or on a journey. The same number of days, which one did not observe Psalm, must be able, to, must make it up, 
make qada of from other days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends for you ease and he does not want you to make, to make things difficult for you. He wants that you must complete the same number of days and that you must magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through takbirat, Allahu Akbar, for having guided you so that you may be grateful to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says in the Quran, Bismillah, أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَةَ الصِّيَامِ أَرَّفَثُ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنْ Permitted to you on the night of the fasts, after you've broken your fast, after iftar, is the approach to your wives. Everything becomes halal. You can approach your spouse for your desires. They are your garments, subhanAllah, and you are their garments. Just think of the function of a garment. What is the purpose of a garment? So fasting was made compulsory upon the ummats before, but the extra, extra, extra bonus hasanat reward was not given to them, only to the Muhammad Wasallam's ummah. Because Nabi Wasallam has special attributes, that he is the last, he is rahmatan lil alameen. Therefore, his ummah also has certain attributes which other ummats did not have. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explains this particular concept to us in a hadith of his. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عن أعطيت أمتي خمس خصال في رمضان لم تعطهن أمة قبلهم my ummah were given five things for Ramadan which were not given to anyone, any of the ummahs before. Five things were given to my ummah because of Ramadan that the other ummahs did not have. For example, first, Khulufu Fami Saimi. أَطْيَبُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ رِحِ الْمِسْكِ For them, the halitosis, the bad odor that emanates due to fasting from the stomach of the person, your mouth smells, yes, bad breath. He says, for them, the smell from the mouth of a fasting person is more sweeter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the fragrant smell of the most expensive musk. Our generation, perhaps my generation might know something about musk, but the new generation, they've got no idea what musk is. Since everything is artificial, what they give you in bottles, you may not even like the smell of musk or because they're all artificial. Real musk comes from usually the city of Khotan in Afghanistan. Very famous. And they have one particular deer, they call the musk deer. They have pouches on the sides of their necks. They grow naturally. Inside there is a black substance. When they become overgrown, they go and try the the what the, put their heads onto the trees and uh, try to get rid of them. Scratch, 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 eventually they fall off. And when they fall off, the people collect this and they turn into this particular uh, atar, particular perfume. And this perfume, since for thousands of years, it is the most natural and it is the most expensive perfume. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uses the word musk, meaning that human beings value the smell, the fragrance, 
that the scent that they put on themselves so that others can smell. And the more expensive your musk is, the more prestige that you have amongst the people. So Rasulullah says, Fami Sa'im, the smell that emanates from the mouth of a fasting person, you might see it as something that not very pleasant yourself or to other people who are close to you. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing something very special. You're fasting for Allah. Therefore, the smell of this fast is far more greater in value in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than what you consider to be expensive perfume. That is atar. That is musk atar. Then Rasulullah sallam says, وَتَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُمُ الْحِيطَانُ حَتَّى يُفْطِرُ On their behalf, the fish in the sea seek forgiveness for the fasting persons until they break their fast. Excuse me, 21st century, we did not hear any fish making any uh, tasbih or dhikr or dua, what are you talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, everything other than mankind and the jinn kind who are put here for test, they've got a different goal. Every other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly Remember and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way, in their own language. Every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the universe, including ants, including fish. Why ants and fish? Because in the hadith, Sahih hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, for the seeker of knowledge and the teacher of knowledge, for an alim, even fish in the ocean and the ants in the in the nests they constantly ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this particular person we believe that's what iman is taking the word of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam as to be truth from the heart scientifically physically you may not prove anything but if you are Looking at from a different metaphysical perspective, you see many, many things. You hear many, many things. The adhkar, even of the rock, even of the uh, non-animate objects. During the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a tree, can a tree walk? The tree came and gave salams to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and made shahada to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The rocks used to talk to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The pebbles in his hand to showing to Abu Jahl said the shahad, rocks, pebbles, talk. Uh, we may not have the equipment to hear it, but if we had the equipment, like when you have the gadgets, to, you, can, you can actually measure the sound waves, you can electromagnetic the, the waves, you can measure many things, but if you don't have the gadget, you don't, you don't see things, you don't feel things, unless you are in contact with them. Electricity. We don't see electricity. We don't see the air. We don't, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Of course, even the Wi-Fi that you use on your phone, well, if you don't have a Wi-Fi, you go crazy. If somebody says, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a Wi-Fi. What's a Wi-Fi? This is going back 100 years. You try to explain to them, I'm looking for Wi-Fi. They will laugh at you. They said, you lost your mind. Similarly, because you don't understand it, it doesn't mean that it does not exist. So our Nabi wasallam, tells us that even the fish by their trillions, all of them make Istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your behalf. Second gift. The first is خلوف فم الصائم أطيب عند الله من ريح المسك The smell, bad odor 
that emanates from the mouth of a Muslim fasting person is more valued in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the most expensive musk. The second, even the fish in the oceans, in the rivers, everywhere they make dhikr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because fish is so plenty that it is perhaps a symbolic name. Maybe not literal in the sense, but because they have the largest population in the oceans. From largest to smallest, all species, they all make تَسْتَغْفِرُ وَلَهُمْ وَهُمُ الْحِيطَانُ حَتَّى يُفْطِرُوا Until a Muslim breaks his fast at iftar time, they continue to make dua for him. وَيُزَيُّنُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ جَنَّتَهُ ثُمَّ يَقُولُ يُوشِكُ عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ أَنْ يُلْقُوا عَنْهُمُ الْمَأُونَةَ وَيَصِيرُوا إِلَيْكِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day prepares and decorates a special garden in paradise, in Jannah every day and says to this particular Jannah, this particular special garden. The time is near when my faithful servants shall cast aside the great trials and the tribulations and the tests, the trials of the world and come to you. They'll be released from the prison of the Stunya, a sijin. And they will come and enjoy you. Very special place for the fasting persons. وَتُصَفَّدُ فِيهِ مَرَدَةُ الشَّيَاطِينِ فَلَا يَخْلُصُوا فِيهِ إِلَّا مَا كَانُوا يَخْلُصُونَ إِلَيْهِ فِي غَيْرِهِ Then in this month, in the month of Ramadan, evil-minded shayateen, all the major ones, big ones, they're all put to chain, they'll be chained in the prisons of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as to not to reach onto those evils to which they normally reach during the other months besides Ramadan. So there is no shaitan to give you waswasa. Do this haram, do this haram, do this haram. In the, your business transactions, in your family, get angry. Constantly. The shaitan is not there. So it becomes easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a head start, a kick start, so, so that it's easier for us to fast. We can have a better self-control. Otherwise shaitan will give you all the waswasa dark suggestions and you'll be in trouble you won't be able to control yourself there's also a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَيُغْفَرُ لَهُمْ فِي آخِرِ لَيْلِهِ then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last night of Ramadan will forgive all of them all the fasting Muslims the companions were Quite surprised, they said, Qila, Ya Rasulullah, Ahiya Laylatul Qadr? Qala, La, Walakin il Amilu inna ma yuwafa ajruhu ida qada amaluhu. When the companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, is this night that you just mentioned that Allah forgives all of them? Is that that special night which we know as Laylatul Qadr? Laylatul Qadr? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, No, definitely not. But it is only right that a servant should be given his reward. His reward on having completed his fasting, his services. So when somebody works for us, they did a job, a contractor, at the end of their job, once it's completed successfully, they want to be paid. As Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, pay your workers 
before their sweat dries up. Pay them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give and forgive and reward His servants, free their necks from the fire of Jahannam, acquittal from the fire of Jahannam, if their names are registered amongst the people of Jahannam, will be completely forgiven on the last day of Ramadan, fasting. And the next day is Eid. Allahu Akbar. Again, both the great Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Imam Bazar as well as Bayhaqi, in describing the holy month of Ramadan, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَهُوَ شَهْرٌ أَوَّلُهُ رَحْمَةٌ الله أكبر وأوسطه مغفرة وآخره عدق من النار رمضان is divided into three segments one third second third and the final third divide into three أوله first ten days نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم says this month, the first part of which brings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. It is just rahmah coming to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you rahmah, His blessings. It's like rain, beautiful. When your hearts are parched, when you are so thirsty, your plants are dying, the earth is dying, and the rain starts. Not floods, not torrents, but we're talking about gentle rain that constantly 24 hours, 10 days. The best rain for the farmers is that kind of rain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his rahmah to you and you feel that you are becoming, you know, just thawing from the sins of the previous 11 months, you come to your senses, your heart begins to work, respond to your, your deeds that you are doing. For, so the first 10 days brings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. وَأَوْسَطُهُ مَغْفِرَةً Next 10 days, from the 11th till the 20th. 10 days. First 10, rahmah. Second days, maghfirah, forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to forgive. Forgive, forgive and forgive. And وَآخِرُهُ And the last 10 days of Ramadan, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, عِدْقٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ That is, last 10 days brings emancipation from the fire of Jahannam. It will save your neck. عِدْقٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ This one here, it will save your neck from Jahannam. Subhanallah. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, one of the greatest companions of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is who was from initially Iran, comes from a very good family, a noble family, and a child, young child, although his parents are Majusi, fire worshippers, he discovers, just out of curiosity, some Christian monks, church. Then he becomes a Christian. He dedicates his life to a master and learns Christianity. Then his, when his master dies, his master says, go to another person. He goes to another person, another monk. For years at his service, then the third one, says to him that we are expecting the final prophet of Allah upon us very soon, according to our calculations, all the signs. He shall come to a city where full of date palm trees, describing Medina. says, you would find him there. says, I will not uh, refer you to, to another person. But you go and find him. This should be the time. 
So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he made hijrah, Salman al-Farisi already sold himself freely with his own free will to bondage, to become a slave of some traders in Mecca that who were going into Medina, from Medina, going into Medina to the caravan owners. So these caravan owners got a free to a slave, a young man who is, mashallah, healthy. When they came to Medina, they sold him to a Jewish person, a Yahudi. And Salman al-Farisi was living amongst them, and but his heart and ears are all open, waiting for this prophet. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, he knew all the description of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the Bible, from the scriptures that he used to study with his teachers. So he looked everything that he saw in the books identical to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Except two things that he could not verify. So he came, he, he came approaching Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a plate of fresh dates. And he presented to him. He dressed like a slave, that he's a slave at that time. Gave, gave to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, What is this that you're giving to us? He says, this is charity, sadaqah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is haram for the prophets of Allah to accept charity. We cannot accept charity. Therefore, you give it to my companions, the people who are around. You give it to them, distribute to them. Mm, my question was answered because the none of the prophets of Allah will ever accept any charity. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not accept charity. Then, the following day, he brought some dates again. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, what is this? He said, this is a gift for you. He says, we accept gifts. And he took gifts, the, the dates, he took perhaps one or two and gave the rest to his companions. Then he says, one more to go. One more thing that I need to verify, but I have no way of verifying it. What was that? Because in the books, that he was studying from, it said, those books said that he will have a seal of prophethood on his back, a particular birthmark, a very special, unique birthmark on his back. So he says, how am I going to ask the prophet to open up his, you know, take his clothes off and let me say, see his and verify his birthmark. So he couldn't say anything, so he went back. He was walking back. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, come here. He came back to him. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa removed his outer garment and he showed his birthmark. He said, is this what you're looking for? When he saw this, immediately he made, he made the shahada and he became a Muslim. And he has served so much the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, he was still a, a slave. Therefore, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to free him from slavery, from, from his master, from bondage. So he sent news to the Jewish owner, master, says, we want to free, we want to buy Salman from you, off you. And he says, no, 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 I'm not interested. He says, name your price. Name your price. Whatever you want, we'll give you. Oh, he said, in that case, different story. What would be the different story? He said, I want, with the measurement, two kilos of gold. Where do you find two kilos of gold? I did not use kilos, but I'm just telling you for the uh, sake of uh, the story. And he says, I want fruit giving. 60 or 70 trees, fruit bearing, date trees in a garden. But 
the uh, the banat, the small seedlings that you when you plant uh, the palm trees, it takes seven eight years to grow. And before they bear any fruit, it'll be about ten years. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Deal, accept it." He says, "Show me where the, your garden is, where you want the trees to give fruit." And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took the banat, the seedlings, little plants of the tree, and with his mubarak hands, one, two three, four, all the way to equal number that he wanted, 60, 70. Yes. Then <laughs> it is said that both uh, Omar radiallahu and his uh, companion, they also put a bit further next to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa trees. He says within less than, very short period of time, less than six months, those great trees began to grow and within less than six months, they begin to give fruit. They're laden with so much fruit. This is a mu'jiza of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now the second is the gold. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked for as small as possible nugget that people might have. Somebody gave a little nugget, tiny, two grams, one gram. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam put a saliva on it and begin to read on it. And it began to grow, grow, grow to the amount, size, the kilos that the the Yahud wanted. So he gave that big chunk of gold nugget to this particular Jewish person. Then of course, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fulfilled his end of the bargain. So Salman radiallahu an was taken. So Salman is very special to the extent that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Salman is from my family. Because amongst the Arabs, if you don't belong to a family, you don't have ancestry, and they still had that you know, this particular argument amongst themselves. Al Hakumut Takathur Hatta Zurtumul Maqabir. He said they used to boast towards each other that I am from this family, I am from this family, I am from this family. And to the extent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Al Hakum al Takath of Surah, they went to the graves and said, That's our grave, that's our grave, that's our grave. They count everybody. So, who's going to have the greatest number of members in the tribe, their tribe? So, Salman al Farisi, he didn't have anybody. He was feeling sad. And some of the companions were teasing him. He's got nobody because he came alone only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to meet the Prophet and to follow him. His life journey was one of pain, one of difficulty, suffering, sacrifice. So he came and he became a Muslim, but he's got nobody. He can't say, oh, my family is this one, I have so many people. He's got nobody alone. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Salman ibn al-Islam, he is the son of Islam. And he is from my family. On remember of Ahlul Bayt, Salman al Farisi, radiallahu He served so much as a leader, as a governor, even during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu He was a great Sahab. So he, Ibn Khuzayma's collection, he narrates this particular hadith, which gives. I've chosen this hadith in particular. It gives a round, beautiful, holistic uh, definition of what's happening in Ramadan. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, خَطَبَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي آخِرِ يَوْمٍ مِنْ شَعْبَانَ فَقَالْ On the last day, of Sha'ban. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed us and said, said to us, although today is not the last day of Sha'ban, but we are approaching the last few days of Sha'ban, inshallah, um, this time next week we are already fasting. So, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يا أيها الناس قد أظلكم شهر عظيم 
Oh people, there comes over you now a great month, Shahrun Azim. Not, not an order, ordinary month, but the greatest month. What kind of month is this? Mubarakun. It is the most blessed month of the year. Shahrun fihi laylatun khayrun min alf shahr. In this month, in which lies a night more greater in virtue than a thousand months. Allahu Akbar. That special and hidden night, as we all know, is Laylatul Qadr. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues, Shahrun ja'ala Allahu siyamahu faridatan. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala it is a month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made fasting compulsory by the day, fard upon you by the day. وَقِيَامَ لَيْلِهِ تَطَوَّعًا And has made the sunnah taraweeh by night. Special prayer we call this taraweeh. We pray normal salat, but taraweeh is only prayed in Ramadan. Tatawwa means all voluntary acts of ibadah, which is not fard. But there is a catch here. Man taqarraba fihi bi khaslatin kana kaman adda faridatan fi ma siwa. Whoever intends drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by performing any nawafil, any sunnah, not fard, any voluntary form of worship, like taraweeh, like all your sunnahs, all the other activities, all khair and hasanat, that you do anything, every good deed in Ramadan. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, for, sh for such person shall be the reward like the one who has performed a fard act as if you are doing a fard fard you cannot compare because fard is directly linked to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore fard is completely different if you do something that is just optional in Ramadan something that is good myriad of things you can do Allah gives you the reward as if that you have performed a fard act. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَمَنْ أَدَّى فَرِيضَةً فِيهِ كَانَ كَمَنْ أَدَّى سَبْعِينَ فَرِيضَةً فِي مَا سِوَى And whosoever performs any of the fard acts in Ramadan, in Ramadan, any of the normally performing fard acts that you do, your daily salat, for example. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever performs a fard act shall be blessed with the reward of 70 fara'id, plural of the word fard, 70 fard acts in any other time. Allahu Akbar. That's why some smart Muslims they give their zakat in the month of Ramadan. Because to give zakat is fard. But it will be multiplied by 70 times in terms of reward. Attending the salat, you already get 25 times, 27 times. If you are in a jamia, the main masjid, Jum'ah masjid, that's 50 times. Times 70. And some Muslims are so smart, mashallah. They go to Makkah al mukarram Umrah, in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Or they stay all of Ramadan, some of them. They stay in Masjid al-Haram. One prayer in Masjid al-Haram is automatically multiplied by 100,000 times. And because it is Ramadan, 
times 70. You just calculate. Subhanallah, they're smart businessmen, hasanat businessmen, and businesswoman for that matter. That's why it is very popular to go to um, i'tikaf, and the reward for i'tikaf is also different, added on during the month of Ramadan. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam continues in the hadith narrated by Salman ibn Farisi radiyallahu an. وهو شهر الصبر. This is indeed the month of training in sabr, patience. You learn self-control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain halal things haram for us during fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says don't drink any water, nothing. Nil orally, don't drink any water. Subhanallah. Don't eat, don't help yourself with what is halal for you from your halal wife or husband. Intimacy. During fasting, it's haram. Absolutely. A month of sabr. So we say, by all means, Ya Rabbana. We hear and obey. Sami'ana wa ta'ana. Even if we are so thirsty, our tongue is so dry and our throat is so parched with thirst, we will be patient and only for you because we are fasting. One meaning of sabr, according to uh, uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Asad Jushan Aziz. He says one meaning of sabr is anger management, where you practically apply la taghdab rule. One companion came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I will send you. Please give me some good, some advice that you can, I can benefit from. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows this person. He's a very good person. He comes to the masjid. He gives sadaqah. He gives charity. He does everything nice. Except he's got one flaw. One particular defect. And because of this defect, he destroys everything else. That defect is, he gets angry. He blows his fu the fuses very quickly. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows him. So when he says, Al-Sini Ya Rasulullah, please advise me, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La taghdab. Don't be angry. Control your anger. Oh, he just, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hit the uh, nail in the head, on the head. So, okay, he says, please give me another one. Give me another one. So the second time he's asking, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La taghdab. Don't get angry. Don't lose it. Oh, I know my weakness. Oh, he says, Ya Rasulullah, give me another one. The third time, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La taghdab. Do not have ghadab. Do not become angry. Do not lose your temper. He knew. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew. Allah taught him everything. Therefore, he is the doctor. He's the doctor, he knows his patient. So he says, if you were to control your ghadab, you sh is, you're a very good person, but once you become angry, you hurt everybody around you, your loved ones. You do not, when you are fasting, you're supposed to control your anger. Control, be, be patient. So anger management, we said. To your child, you do not scream and shout. Even if they're not fasting, they're just children. Children meant to make noise. To your wife, you should be extremely gentle. Extremely gentle and kind. Don't criticize, don't. Because once in the afternoon, when the glucose level in your brain reduces, you become very agitated. 
So you, it's easier for you to lose your temper. But control, sabr. So towards your neighbor, they're making too much noise. I can't sleep. But their neighbors, they're, they're, they've got their private lives. You have to show sabr towards your neighbors. Be gentle with them. Halim, Clement, Salim. Yeah, you need to be sound. No harm should ever come from your tongue or your words, your, your hands, your actions. That's what a true Muslim is. The second meaning of sabr, according to our Sheikh again, he says it's an inlet management into your heart. We have inlets into our hearts that the ruh sees and interprets and acts upon. What are those inlets? Our ears. This one, our tongue, our eyes, our thought processes. We need to control them. What goes into your heart? What goes into your heart? You need to hold your tongue. Don't say anything. Don't talk nonsense. Just be quiet. You need to control your eyes. If you cannot control your eyes that you see and look and watch and uh, whatever, you waste your time on the Netflix or something else, utter nonsense, then what's the purpose of fasting? You're supposed to let your limbs fast, your eyes fast, your ears fast, your tongue fast. Your thought processes fast, your stomach fast. If you sabr, if you understand this properly and apply it properly, you are actually training yourself in taqwa also. Self-control. Against harams, against temptations. So the month of patience. And what, what is the reward for being patient, mastering patience in your in yourself? Wasabru thawabuhu al-jannah. Allahu Akbar. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, and the reward for true patience is nothing other than Jannah, paradise. One way ticket to Jannah. Sabr. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues وَشَهْرُ الْمُسَاوَاتِ It is the month of sympathy with one's fellow men, people around, with the community. Another name for month of Ramadan is شَهْرُ الْمُسَاوَاتِ Month of sympathy feeling for others, empathy, feeling what the others are feeling. What kind of sympathy are we talking about? Shahrul Musawat means a month of financial and material help, food, clothing and monetary help to the people who are less fortunate than you are. MashaAllah, I see people send me Lots of uh, uh, information about the good projects that they are doing. In Ramadan, mashallah, the generosity of Muslims overflow. So they send food packages, parcels to Muslim families. They made a list. Just a gift. Amazing. Or sometimes in Lebanon, in Palestine, in some other poorer in African countries where Muslims need they open up a well for example in Ramadan they give this charity so that you can feel you can sympathize you feel empathy empathy towards people who are less fortunate than you are so the month of Shahrul Musawat means charity Shahrul Musawat means benevolence, sharing, kindness towards people around us who are less fortunate than us. Starting with the Muslim community. Shahrul Musawat means month of 
winning hearts and putting smiles on faces. So majority of our Mashaykh will tell us that you don't enter in Ramadan with a broken heart across hearts. Meaning, whoever you are not being talking to, you have broken, damaged your relationship with anybody in the community, ask for forgiveness because you are entering into month of Ramadan. So your heart is free from the shackles of hatred, pet hatreds and animosity, little puny animosity for no reason because they said something or they posted something on the fitna book or something, something, something that you feel grudge in your heart towards them. So this will also be erased from your heart before you enter into Ramadan. Shahrul Musawat means month of relief for the needy, collectively for the community. There are many people who are below the standard of living. They can't pay their bills. They can't buy things for their children. They can't afford to buy, uh, buy the books of their children for school or the clothing for their, school, their children's school. I'm just giving you an example. So if you know such people, there could be some single mothers, there could be some single parents. So there could be some people who had some difficulty in their lives, displaced families. You find them and give them, extend your help because everything is brought up to the level of fard in terms of hasanat. Putting shahrul musawat means month of sympathy, sympathy is putting surur, happiness, in the hearts of fellow Muslims. By all means. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the greatest act that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves most in His sight is when you put happiness into a fellow Muslim's heart. Surur fi qalbil Muslim. Surur, happiness, putting smiles. If a person is really downtrodden, the person is really pressured with so many debts, he can't make payments, he lost his job, and he's suffering. You can see his attitude completely changed. He's really stressed out. He's depressed. If you are in a position, find such people and put a smile on your face because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says when you come to the need of a fellow Muslim in this world Allah will come to your need in the hereafter when you need it most but do it only for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala not for sure وَشَهْرٌ يُزَادُ فِي رِزْقِ الْمُؤْمِنِ مُؤْمِنِ فِي Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in this month Wherein a believer's, a Muslim's, a mu'min's true believer's rizq, sustenance is increased. Our homes overflow with so much rizq. Allahu Akbar. What Muslims spend, I don't know where they get the money from, on food in the month of Ramadan, they did not spend the whole 11 month of the year. Amazing. Our tables overflow with barakah. Our hearts filled with overabundance of spiritual sustenance. Not only just physical sustenance, but the spiritual sustenance. You even get shocked, dismayed and astonished with your own self. You say, wow, I actually feel. You begin to cry because the heart is filling with the rahmah and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart begins to respond to the Qur'an, to the talks. When you hear something from somebody you cannot control, your heart begins to, subhanAllah, begins to dance. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ فَطَّرَ فِيهِ صَائِمًا كَانَ مَغْفِرَةً لِذُنُوبِهِ Whosoever feeds another who fasted like him in order to break the fast at sunset, iftar time, 
for the feeder there shall be forgiveness of sins subhanallah that's the first gift some people are so smart when they're traveling together if they knew that they're going to break the fast on the road they prepare some dates some small things and they keep it in their bag so there are five six muslims next to them he says as soon as they break here's your water small bottle of water and the date please break a fast subhanallah at that moment allah subhanahu completely forgives you then nabi sallallahu says wa'id qa raqabatihi min an nar and he, he's, he shall be emancipated from the fire of Jahannam. وَكَانَ مِثْلَهُ وَكَانَ مِثْلَ أَجْرِهِ وَكَانَ لَهُ مِثْلَ أَجْرِهِ And for such feed there shall be the same reward as, as the one who fasted, whom, whom he fed, gave dates to break. مِنْ غَيْرِ أَنْ يُنْقَصَ مِنْ أَجْرِهِ شَيْءٌ Without that person's reward being decreased in the least. So that person gets his full reward. But you get a copy of his reward, identical reward, into your account. Because you allowed that person to break fast. You provided something for him. This is very important for us. Islamically, Muslims are used to be more strict on this one. They used to compete with one another. Nowadays, because of coronavirus and perhaps a bit more people are becoming islands, more individuals rather than the family unit or rather than the community spirit, they do not fulfill this particular sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, advice of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, to invite people to our homes to break iftar, is a very virtuous thing where they come and break your, break their fast in your house with the pro food that you prepared for them you get all forgiveness your sins are forgiven and you freed your neck from the hellfire and without anything being lessened from their reward you get a copy of their reward there is another, another Good news just follows this this particular statement of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the same hadith of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu Qalu ya Rasulullah laysa kulluna yajidu ma yufattiru as-sa'im He says ya Rasulullah we don't have enough food for ourselves to break even our fast how we, if we don't find any food to allow other people to break their fast or invite our home because we are very poor. What can we do then? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as we know, the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suffered a lot. It is not even remotely possible, remotely conceived for us to understand, fathom, for us, the sufferings they went through. I'll give you one example. Abu Hurair radiallahu an used to stay in Ashab al-Sufa, the veranda that was attached to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa masjid, masjid, where about 70, 70, Students used to come and study with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam full time. And if there was any gift that came from the community, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will pass it on to them so they can eat food. But the times were so tough. They, were, they did not have food to eat. They were hungry. Abu Huraira says, for so many days I did not eat, just drinking that little murky water. Nothing, I don't have any energy. He says, I lie down at the footpath of people 
So if they see that pale face of mine that I'm really suffering, they might give me something to eat. I can stay alive for one more day. He says, I saw Omar radiallahu anh coming towards me. I put my hand up and they pretend to ask him a question so he can see me. I asked him a question, he answered and walked away because he didn't have anything. Then Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh came, I did the same, he did not understand. He answered my question, but he did not understand. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. He understood immediately, he says, come with me. He took me inside the house. He says, there is a glass, a glass of milk, this much. Milk. And he said, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, call everybody in. Ashabu Sufa, the students who are studying, the poor of the poorest, the poorest of the poor. Nabi uh, the, the, the Abu Hurairah is thinking, why? He says, we're going to share, we're going to have this milk together for 70 people. He says, I can finish that myself 10 times over to himself. But how dare could he ever refused the command of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, disobey him. So he went and says, oh people, come. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has some milk for you. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, ask them to come inside 10 by 10, 10 by 10. Not altogether. So Salman is, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the milk in the hands of Salman. And he said, you give it to them first. Start, Bismillah. So man Farisi looked at the milk, oh, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And of course he has to obey Rasulullah He gave it to the first person. That person began to drink and drink and drink until his fill, the milk was coming out of their mouth. And he passed on to the next one. The same thing happened, they drank and drank, filled their tummy with the full fat milk. That's a sustenance, nourishment. The next, the next, the next, 70 people finished drinking. And I says, I forgot because I was in a different mind. Then I looked at it, exactly identical amount is in the glass. I looked at people, they're all drinking. Already drank, finished. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at me, he says, Ya Aba Huraira, drink now. Say Bismillah. He says, I began to drink and drink and drink and drink after finishing i could no longer take any more i am filled to the rim nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says drink i do. then and then i couldn't drink anymore he says i swear by allah who sent you as a messenger ya rasulullah i can't take it anymore i'm full then nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam smiled he took the glass from my hand and there was a little bit of milk left and he just drank it himself. Perhaps this is a mojiza. Of course it was a mojiza. But the same, the same Abu Huraira tells us, he says, again, for three, four days, I could not, I could not eat anything, no food, not even smallest amount. So he says, one particular night it was a fool Moonshine, full moon outside, very bright. I went the normal place that we usually go to relieve ourselves, urinate, away from people. So I went and I sat down and I began to urinate. But my urine in the dark, I can't see anything. Yeah, although there is moon, but I can't see anything. It, it splashed onto something, it made a sound. With my hand, I looked, oh, some piece. I brought it to the light. It was a dead skin of an animal, a piece, a parchment. He says, I took this with me to the water. I washed it, washed it, washed it, washed it until my heart is content, that it is clean. And I put it on water, on the fire, made it soft, 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 in other words, semi-cooked, and I began to eat this. No human being will eat this. 
But when you are dead desperate, at the brink of death, because of hunger, yeah? So he says, I ate this, and that lasted me for three more days. That's why I said, it is not possible for us to comprehend what the companions went through because of poverty, because of lack of needs. So when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, when you, when you get all these hasanat, if you allow somebody to break their fast, when you give them a date, or when you give them something to break their fast, invite them to your house, so to speak, the companion says, لَيْسَ كُلُّنَا يَجِدُ مَا يُفَطِّرُ الصَّائِمِ Ya Rasulullah, we don't have even food for ourselves. We don't even, how can we have food for the others? We're going to miss out on this particular, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُعْطِ اللَّهُ هَذَا الثَّوَابَ مَنْ فَطِّرَ صَائِمًا عَلَى تَمْرَةٍ أو شربة ماء أو مذقة اللبن. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will grant grants the same reward to the one who gives a fasting person to break the fast a mere dry date, simple, you know, dry date like a little small olive, yes, a a sip of water to drink. Or a sip of milk to drink, if they have, they get the same reward. Not some luxurious 20 meal course or course meal. Not, not israf. We're talking about halal and tayyibah within your means. Not be extravagant, not to make israf, not to throw the food away just to impress people. That's not the intention of this hadith, not the intention of breaking your fast. Therefore, without ever belittling our own efforts and saying that I don't have enough, I can't afford to, no. Whatever you can, with the right intention, allow people to break their fast. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continues in the hadith وَهُوَ شَهْرٌ أَوَّلُهُ رَحْمَةٌ This is a month Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the first of which brings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah His mercy like a beautiful rain Rahmah descends continuously to quench the thirst of our barren and parched hearts وَأَوْسَطُهُ مَغْفِرَةٌ The middle of which brings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, maghfirah. We all sinful. Nobody's perfect. We have black faces of the sins, because of the sins. Our past is really dark. We have many, many, many shortcomings. But when a person continues to fast and fast and fast from the beginning of the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to wash him with that rain of rahmah. And comes the middle of the month, he's already, mashallah, washed away. Allah begins to forgive, forgive, soften that hard heart first, then after that, forgive, 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 forgive. وَآخِرُهُ عَيْتْقٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ And the last of which brings freedom, emancipation from the fire of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include our names amongst those people. We shall be freed, emancipated from the fire of Jahannam, inshallah. Better still, never and ever put our names on that list. Better still, never even go through Jahannam, inshallah ta'ala. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changes the attention, our attention to a social side of fasting. Man khaffafa an mamlukihi فِيهِ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ وَأَعْتَقَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whosoever lessens the burden of his servants, his workers. In this month, Allah will forgive him. You've got people working under you, some apprentices, 
And some workers that day work hard, do hard work, bricklaying to concreting. You're a tradie. Or in that, in that heat, they are already fasting. They've got no energy. Be easy on them with the right intention. Give them at least two or three hours before if that break. Go home. You don't have to stay. Normally you work until 5, 6. Today I'm going to let you go at 2 o'clock. If you do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what will happen? وَأَعْتَقَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Allah will also save your neck from those list of people who will end up in Jahannam. Allahu Akbar. Act of kindness. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turns our attention to us. وَاسْتَكْثِرُوا فِيهِ مِنْ أَرْبَعِ خِصَالِ And in this month, four things you should continue to perform in great numbers, says Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What are these things? He goes on to explain. خَسْلَتَيْنِ تُرْضُونَ بِهِمَا رَبَّكُمْ Two of these four things shall be to please your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were to do those two things, Allah will be pleased with you. What was our ghaya, our objective, our focus in life? Ilahi anta maqsudi wa rudaka matlubi. O Allah, you're my goal and what I seek from you is your good pleasure, your rida upon me. So, if you want to receive the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the method. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, if you do, out of the four things that he's going to mention, two of them, Allah will be happy with you. His rida shall be upon you. وَخَسْدَتَيْنِ لَا غِنَاهَا بِكُمْ عَنْهُمَا While the other two shall be those without which you cannot do. You need them. Something that you really desperately need. So, what are these things? Four things that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks us to continuously do in the month of Ramadan. First, فَأَمَّا الْخَصْلَتَانِ اللَّتَانِ تُرْضُونَ بِهِمَا رَبَّكُمْ Those things which shall be to please your Lord Two, are that you should in great quantity first فَشَهَادَةُ أَلَّا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Increase your shahada of لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله سبحان الله Make dhikr of Allah سبحانه وتعالى There is none worthy of worship besides Allah There is only one God لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله How many times you want to say? Up to you But without a number Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Increase Plenty let your tongues, lips be moist with the, this dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aftalu dhikr, la ilaha illallah. Wa aftalu shukr, alhamdulillah, says Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa So dhikr, that la ilaha illallah, increase it so much. Kalamai tayyiba, la ilaha illallah, we should always say. In Ramadan or outside of Ramadan. But in Ramadan, it has a special flavor. Because the heart can respond to it. The second thing that will also please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَتَسْتَغْفِرُونَهُ And make lots and lots of istighfar. Oh Allah, please forgive me. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah al-azim, al-kareem, al لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم ونتوب إليه سيد الاستغفار أستغفر الله العظيم أستغفر الله العظيم أستغفر الله العظيم constantly make أستغفر الله to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Allah please forgive me please forgive me forgive forgive this this sinful servant of yours يا ربي wash me with your رحمة يا ربي please forgive me استغفار 
every Muslim should know what how to say Astaghfirullah and Sayyidul Istighfar. So we have to say a lot of Kalima Tayyib in this Ramadan and we need to say lots of Astaghfirullah. That will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَمَّا الْخَسْلَتَانِ اللَّتَانِ لَا غِنَاءَ بِكُمْ عَنْهُمَا And as for those without which you cannot do, you need it desperately, they are, what are they? فَاسْتَسْأَلُونَ اللَّهَ الْجَنَّةِ وَتَعَوَّذُونَ بِهِ مِنَ النَّارِ you should beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are you asking? Entrance into Jannah, paradise. And what are you seeking refuge in? You seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from falling into Jahannam. Here, yeah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, فَتَسْأَلُونَ اللَّهَ الْجَنَّةِ وَتَعَوَّذُونَ بِهِ مِنَ النَّارِ Ask for these two things that you cannot do without. You need it. You want Jannah and free from Jahannam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Allah, please bless us with every form of khair, goodness in this world. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Also, bless us with all the goodness there is in the hereafter. But you add on, وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Allah, please protect us from falling into Jahannam. We don't want to go to Jahannam first, then go into Jannah. We want to go directly to Jannah. If you want this, increase this particular اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ الْجَنَّةَ وَنَّعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ الْجَنَّةَ وَأَعُوذُ of course we can shoot do, do this inshallah. That's easy to do. Waman Saka fihi saiman, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, and whoever gave a person who fasted water to drink, Sakahullahu ta'ala min hawdi sharbatan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall grant that giver to drink from my fountain. al hawd al kawtha which is part of our belief that when people are suffering from thirst and hunger on the Day of Judgment for waiting for to be judged for 50,000 years, the Ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shall be gathered under the liwa'ul hamd, flag of praise, of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and around Hawdul Kawthar. He will have a huge pond with millions of cups around. And if he were to drink one cup from this particular Hawd of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma ja'anna minhum ya Rabbil Alameen, Allah makers of those people, you shall never feel thirst ever until you enter into Jannah paradise. Hawdul Kawthar. So whoever gives, gives even a sip of water to a fasting person, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah shall grant that giver to drink from my fountain such a drink that لا يضمأ حتى يدخل الجنة where after that person shall never again feel thirsty until he enters Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soften our hearts, remove our ghafla, bless us with sincere tawbah and ikhlas before we enter into the holy month of rahmah, holy month of musawat, holy, mo holy month of absolute maghfira, holy month of Ramadan. Inshallah, we shall continue for another 25 minutes or so. And we'll have a break for Maghrib. And we will resume again at 8 o'clock, inshallah.
There is a hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam both in uh, Bukhari and Muslim Muttafaqun alayhi hadith Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says which is very well known Muslims know this every shaykh will, when they are talking about Ramadan will mention this particular hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam عن ابي هريره رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال عز وجل كل عمل ابن ادم له الا الصيام فانه لي وانا اجزي به والصيام جنه فاذا كان يوم الصوم احدكم فلا يرفث ولا يصخب فَإِنْ سَابَّهُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ قَاتَلَهُ فَلْيَقُلْ إِنِّي صَائِمٌ وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ لَخُلُوفُ فَمِ الصَّائِمِ أَطْيَبُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ رِيحِ الْمِسْكِ لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَانِ يَفْرَحُهُمَا إِذَا أَفْطَرَ فَرِحَ بِفِطْرِهِ وَإِذَا لَقِيَ رَبَّهُ فرح بصومه صدق رسول الله فيما قال أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم tells us again about the virtues of Ramadan he says he narrates to us a hadith Qudsi there is a normal hadith and there is hadith Qudsi hadith Qudsi is غير مطلو something that we don't recite in the Salat or anything as such, it's not like Quran, but it is words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is inspired to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which is not part of Quran. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, Allah said this, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he will explain, but it's not in the Quran. So it is not something that we make tilawah with. It is a hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it is nonetheless, nonetheless, hadith Qudsi, a sacred hadith. The wording belongs to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The meaning, the inspiration comes to the heart of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He explains, passed on to us. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah exalted and majestic said, this is one of those hadith Qudsi. Every act of son of Adam and the daughter of Adam is for himself or herself. Whatever they do, they do any good deed, I reward them. They, you know, voluntarily they go and do something. Any khair and hasanat, no problem. Every act of the son of Adam is for himself. Except a siyam, except fasting. The fasting that I commanded him to do, Ya Yulladina Mana Kutiba alaykum as siyam, yes, I have commanded him with, which is exclusively for me. This siyam is done purely for me, and I personally will reward him. Him. Reward for it. So yeah. Meaning, everything in Islam, every good deed has a hasanat tag, like a price tag. You look at it, oh, this is 3,000, this is 200, this is 10. And in the Quran, there is another rule. Every single good deed is multiplied automatically by default by 10, 10 times. You do one goodness, Allah gives you 10 times the reward. So everything has a hasanat tag. But certain things do not have a hasanat tag. For example, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the masjid and somebody came, stood in the middle of his masjid and he said, Ya Rabbi, Lakal Hamd, 
كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحان الله النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم turned his face towards him he says come here what did you say and why did you say it he said ya rasulullah i said this ya rabbi lak alhamd kama yanbaghi li jalali wajhika wa la'zim sultanik he says why did you say this he says because before i left home i said to myself that i'm going to go into the middle of the masjid of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that nobody has praised before he said that inspired in my heart and I came and said it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled. He said, when you said such words, the angels who were writing the hasanat, the price tag checking, they could not find it in their books. They were so excited. They said, what do we write? What do we write? There is nothing in the books for this particular tasbih. What do we write? They went to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, He says, write it as it is. Again in Salat, Salat this time. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leading the Salat, when he came out of Ruku'ah, came up from Ruku'ah, he said, Samia Allahu liman hamida, like we normally do. And somebody said, in not so audible, but whispering sound that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard. What did he say? رَبَّنَا لَكَ الْحَمْدِ حَمْدًا كَثِيرًا طَيِّبًا مُبَارَكًا فِيهِ Allahu Akbar Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after giving salams he says who said that? He says I said it Ya Rasulullah He said you have completely confused the angels they know what to write so it was written in their book as is now Salat is such worship, ibadah, command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says from the hadith Qudsi that everything that son of Adam does has a prize tag, sorry, hasanat tag. But the fasting is not. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that fasting is exclusively for me and I alone will reward him for it. How? comes the day of judgment. When our books are given into our hands, either from right or the front, or the left or the back, may Allah protect us from such left or back option. May Allah allow us to receive our, from our book from the right hand side, or the left, Ashabul Yameen, the people of the right. So. That means if you receive it from the right hand side of the front, that means you're going to go to Jannah. That's the first indication. But if you receive from your left or the back, that's the red flag. That means you're going to go to Jannah. You're going to suffer. So, when our books are given to us, and when our turn comes to Allah, the, to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His mahkamah, in His court, Malik Yawmiddin, at tadin or Tudan, the one who judges you personally and gives you whatever you've done, the result, he passes the verdict on you. When you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when your books open and you see so many ugly sins, although for every sin you, you get only one sin written for you, but for every good deed you're supposed to get ten and you did. But even then you have so many, so little hasanat and you have so many sins. And you look at the scales where it's going to be weighed because the rule is if your good deeds, your thawab, your hasanat is heavier than your sins, you go to Jannah. Allah forgives you. That's the rule. But if your sins are huge, more than your good deeds, then you're in trouble. If Allah wishes, He can forgive you. If Allah didn't where they wish it, He wants to be just and fair with you, He will send you to Jahannam first. You pay for your Jews in Jahannam, be there for millions and millions of years, then after that you come out and go to Jahannam. But nobody wants to go to Jahannam. Jahannam is burning. So when you look at your amount of 
hasanat that you have in comparison to the sayyat, the sins that you have. Your sins are like mountains and your good deeds are just little. And of course they put on the scales. Assuredly, your sins hit the rock bottom. It's so heavy and your head is down. You don't know what to do. That means you're going to cop it. Then we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the malaika, put this onto his right side, his good deed side of the scale. A little tiny, tiny piece of paper perhaps. They put it onto it. And then, whoa, it hits the bottom and the sins are up in the air. So light. That means your fate has changed. You're not going to Jahannam anymore. You're going to go to Jannah. Just, you, you are so overwhelmed with this excitement. You ask, Ya Rabbi, what is this? I never knew anything as such that I did. I can't see and I can't remember anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to that servant, this is the hasanat reward that I promised you that I alone shall reward you with. That is for your fasting in Ramadan. So that, remember, in the Hadith Qudsi, in this Hadith, in the Sahih Hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, every action that Adam does, a son of Adam, daughter of Adam does for himself, he gets his reward. But fasting purely for me, and therefore I shall alone reward him for it, and this is the reward. Subhanallah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued in the hadith. He says, Fasting is a jannah, a shield against fire of Jahannam, of course. When any one of you is observing fast, he should neither indulge in any obscene language, swearing, nor should he raise his voice, become angry, lose his cool, and if anyone reviles him, somebody swears at you, somebody lost his temper, yeah, their temper, and they begin to hmm, say things, ugly things towards you. And of course, you're carrying enough, so you want to respond to this. You don't want to. Why? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if somebody reviles him or tries to quarrel him, he should say, I am fast. I am fasting today. By him in whose hand the soul of Muhammad sallallahu is, this is a form of oath Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa used to make every now and then to emphasize the importance of the point to come. He says, I swear by Allah who holds the soul of Muhammad sallallahu in his hand, controls him, the breath of one observing psalm, fasting is sweeter to Allah than the fragrance of musk. The one who fasts experiences two joys. He feels pleasure first when he breaks his fast. SubhanAllah. The best time for Muslims is iftar time. They go crazy because they're going to quench their thirst and they're going to feed themselves. They're happy, and not only that, they have completed a fard command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is joyful by virtue of his fast, and the second joy that he will feel and see is when he meets his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he sees that hasana that I mentioned on his mizan, when everything changes, it's a game changer, and he'll have the biggest farah, happiness in his heart. One is in this dunya, and the other one is in the akhirah. And in the narration of Filaf uh, al-Bukhari, in the narration of Imam Bukhari, in this particular hadith, there is an addition, a ziyadah, where he says, 
Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Allah says, the person fasting, observing soul, has abstained from food and drink and sexual pleasures for my sake. Fasting is for me and I will bestow its reward personally. Every good deed has ten times its reward. Normally. But this fasting is not there. So how did the angels write? Yes. Ahmed has fasted today. Halas. Aisha fasted today. That's it. No, nothing, no number next to it. That will be given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a different hadith that we also know, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, Man sama Ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban ghufra lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi Muttafaqun alayhi hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, He who observes fasting during the month of Ramadan with full faith and with full hope of being rewarded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only that they'll be forgiven yeah and rewarded but he will also have his past sins completely forgiven from the sins that he has committed in the past It'll be all completely washed away. Again, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in Bukhari and Muslim Hadith, "Anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qal, 'Ida jaa Ramadanu, futtihat abwabu al-jannah, wa ghulqat abwabu al-nar, wa sufidat al-shayatin." Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, when Ramadan begins to entice and motivate the Muslims, the gates of Jannah will be flung open, all of them. And the gates of hell be, will be flung shut, closed. Nobody goes into Jahannam. And all the shayateen shall be chained. So they don't cause Chaos, waswasa, fitna, trouble to the Muslims who are fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on our side and He is helping us to achieve the command of fasting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very special distinction of the month of Ramadan, a very special feature of Ramadan during which Muslims become more inclined towards worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They pay great attention to the recitation of Quran al-Kareem. They pay more attention to istighfar and dhikr and salawat upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they feel their sins and they ask for forgiveness all the time. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us from Abu Hurair again both muttafaqun alayhi hadith Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi Fa'in ghabiya alaykum aw fa'in ghum alaykum Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, insha inshallah, in order to save some time, I'm going to uh, go into English and explain the whole purposes for us to understand, inshallah ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, fast, observe siyam, fasting. On sighting the crescent moon, hilal, of Ramadan, 
Start fasting when you see the crescent of Ramadan, moon sighting. And terminate your fasting, finish off your Ramadan on sighting the new moon of the month of Shawwal. If, however, the sky is cloudy and you cannot see the new moon of Shawwal, then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, complete the number to 30 days of the month. Usually Islamic calendar is 29 days and rarely 28 days and sometimes 30. And since Islamic calendar is not like the solar calendar because we follow the lunar method, the sighting of the moon, it is 10 days shorter than the, uh, the solar calendar the Gregorian calendar, the European calendar, which is 365 days. That's why Ramadan comes, changes the dates, 10 days, 10 days, 10 days. After so many years, it makes a full cycle. But it is sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to watch, see the moon. Of course, this was done officially by the Muslim governors in Muslim lands. They've done this for centuries. And sometimes, but Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if it's overcast, that you can't see the moon, then complete that month to 30, and the next day after 30, start on Ramadan. Start on Ramadan. Um, this is what we're supposed to do. And at Coburg Masjid uh, Mosque, we follow the moon sighting. We also respect the brothers who follow their, their imams in following their fatwa in calendar. They follow the calendar and therefore sometimes the dates do not match and Muslims start the Ramadan at a different date and celebrate on a different date the Eid. So we are not going to go into the arguments as such, but it is... There is absolutely Sahih Muttafaqun Alayhi Hadith. Bukhari and Muslim Hadith together they reported. There is no doubt about its authenticity of any kind. It is rigorously authenticated Hadith where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, see the moon of it and start fasting Ramadan and see the crescent of the moon of it and celebrate. Nekiftar. So depending on whatever you're following, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from you. This is an important point for us to understand. In this particular month of Shahrul Azim, another name for Ramadan is Shahrul Quran, Shahrul Rahmah, Shahrul Maghfirah, Shahrul Sabr. Shahr means the month of. Tremendous month of mercy and forgiveness. Inshallah, we will commence it next week. I urge my needy soul as well as yours. I humbly, humbly advise you, but I advise myself first to have taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be, beware of wasting your precious capital, your life on futile activities. Time never comes back. Just tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Seconds move in this linear existence of ours. Once a minute is gone, it'll never come back again. It is always forward moving. Our great Sheikh Muhammad Zaid Qutku Rahmatullah Alayh he says, being the head of the state, being a minister, being the richest person, being a sheikh, being a mufti, these are all futile pursuits if at the end of your life you did not gain the good pleasure 
the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Period. No matter what you are, you are given a capital. That is time limited. If you waste it, it's against you. If you use it for your advantage, it's also for you. As Imam Ghazali rahimahullah says, time is like a two-sided sword. If you don't use the sword to whatever activity that you're doing, it'll, by its nature, it'll come back and hit you and slice you, hurt you. Time is such a gift. If we are given finite number of breaths that we breathe, you can calculate in 80 years, 70 years, 60 years of life, if at the end of your life, if the number of breaths that you spend in remembering Allah is not more than the number of breaths that you wasted your time in a state of heedlessness in ghafla, you are at a loss. Like a tradesperson in a market, at the end of the day they hit the button in the till and it gives you gives them what they have done all the transactions for the day so the number of transactions for that particular day is limited they can't add more on or subtract it from but they will know whether they are in the positive in the black or in the red this is the reality Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was talking to his companions about the activities, Hassanat pursuing activities of the Ummats before. Then companions began to feel so sad. Because Nabi Sallallahu said they lived for thousand years, five hundred years, long life from the life of Nuh we know, nine hundred and fifty years if not more. But the life of this Ummah is very short. 60, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, then we die. We don't have time to do all the good deeds that those people have done in thousand years. So what do we do? Now, we stop here and inshallah have a break until uh, perhaps five past eight because we've taken some of your time <laughs> and we'll come back after Maghrib and a short break and inshallah at five past eight we will continue inshallah ta'ala with the part two of the night bimillah ta'ala jazakum Allah khairul jaza wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulina Muhammedin. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Emma ba'd. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. May Allah accept you maghrib, your salat. After a short break, now we will continue until uh, 9 o'clock. And inshallah tomorrow we will go through all the technical issues. Kitab al-Siyam or Kitab al-Sawm. We said the very last thing before the break. <coughs> we were talking about time management. We should not waste our greatest capital, the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on futile things. Since Ramadan is a very opportune time for us to reconnect, we should not waste our time on futile things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives barakah into the time of a Muslim if he has the right intention and he tries his best to manage his time. And I was just telling you a story during the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the companions were listening to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about the lives of the previous ummats before they lived so long and they worshipped Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so long and yet the life of this ummah is very short. It's all less than 100 years. 60, 70, 80. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself passed away at the age of 63. So, when Muslims asked, when the companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, they have such an opportune time, they worshipped Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for centuries, and yet we have little time. Is it that we feel sad? We did not have a, a time to earn more hasanat like they did. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, received Jibreel Alayhi Salam with the Surah Al-Qadr. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylat Al-Qadr wa ma adra kama Laylat Al-Qadr. Laylat Al-Qadr khayrun min alf shahr. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says we have revealed the Quran on a very special night, Laylat Al-Qadr. And do you know what Laylat Al-Qadr is? Laylatul Qadr, one night is better than 1,000 months of worship. So if a Muslim with sincerity, iman and wahtisaban, were to catch Laylatul Qadr and were to spend time in Ramadan in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his chances of catching Laylatul Qadr is very high. Therefore, as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his time becomes full of barakah and he gets the reward as if he has worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the purest form for 1,000 months. It's about 82 years, 82 point something years. Therefore, if a Muslim catches his Ramadans, his Layl al-Qadr every year, diligently he plans and he works at it, then if he catches 10, it's more than 800 years. So if he catches 20, subhanAllah, that's about 1600 years. So there is a great opportunity. But we have to become cognizant of our time management. And many people, many people waste their time in Ramadan. So um, we must use our time in Ramadan positively and constructively to develop ourselves. It's a one month long taqwa training. So you need to be cognizant of what you're doing, aware of what you're doing, not just being hungry, not just being thirsty or abstinence from intimacy. And that goes without saying. But the real thing is for you to also hone your skills and sharpen your skills of connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your ibadah and becoming aware of your time. Think about it. Allahu alam, maybe this year may well be your last Ramadan. 
many uncles and aunties that I used to know, they passed away during the year. For one reason or another, maybe old age, maybe sickness, something, they were expecting to stay for Ramadan. Nothing happened. So, we have to, we have to do our best to receive this month and spend the month correctly. We must understand that the month of Ramadan is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bountiful blessings on his Muslim servants, believing servants. And if a person were to miss a day from Ramadan, not fasting for petty reasons, oh, I've got an exam today, I've got a headache today, I can't work, I am I'm this, I am this, I am this, none of the shari'i reasons, Islamic reasons, and they miss out on a fast deliberately. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives a warning to us as recorded in the Musnad of Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiallahu anh, where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says مَنْ أَفْتَرَ يَوْمًا مِنْ رَمَضَانَ مِنْ غَيْرِ رُخْصَةٍ وَلَا مَرَضٍ لَمْ يَقْضِهِ صَوْمُ الدَّهْرِ كُلِّهِ وَإِنْ صَامَهُ Whoever does not fast for even one day in Ramadan without a valid Islamic excuse, Sharia excuse, shall never be able to repay that day, missed day, even if he fasts for the rest of his life every day. This is called Sahmu Dahr. It's a missed opportunity. It's like saying, if you did not obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this hour, if this this hour you did not fulfill the requirements of this hour, and once this hour leaves your hand, it'll never come back. This is the reality. So we must use Ramadan as an opportunity, as a turning point in our life. A time for transformation towards a better way of life, spiritual life, to be better servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A chance for us to change from the disgrace of our sins and our habits of nafs al amara to the glory of ita'ah, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despicable, disgusting state of disobedience, ma'asiyah, into the glorious, beautiful state of ita'a, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From weakness and laziness, slothfulness of nafs al ammara to strength and vigor. Jawal, you need to move because everything moves. Everything is moving. From bad habits to taqwa. You earmark one or two habits that you have. Make this Ramadan as our starting point that you will give up. And you will change. Think positively. On your akhlaq. Husn al-khuluq. Work on your akhlaq. To beautify your akhlaq. Your righteousness. Your birr your upright conduct, your behavior towards your parents, behavior towards your relatives, behavior towards siblings, and towards the Ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, my advice to myself and you, my respected viewers, brothers who are attending this course and the sisters who are attending the course, let us make a firm Niyya, intention to make an effort this particular Ramadan. At least in this Ramadan, let us try to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and establish our daily salat in jama'ah, in the masjid. Never miss salatullah. Never, never, never miss Salatul Taraweeh. 
and must perform it diligently, bringing our families to the mosque in the evening. They should feel the spirituality. To spend as much time as possible in dua, mukhul ibadah, the essence of worship, in tilawat al Quran, because this month is the month of Quran, and dhikrullah, we desperately need it, and which will ensure the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. We must encourage our family members by way of example kindly remind us, our friends and relatives, to, more, to be more diligent Muslims by firstly setting an example of being one ourselves. To protect your fast, guarding your inlets into your heart, your tongue, your eyes, your ears, your thought processes, you must try your best. Even if you're sick, that the doctor, a Muslim doctor says to you that you can't fast, you are heavily dependent on certain medications, get up for suhoor with your family, wake them up, do your tahajjud as per normal, then eat with them. Partake in that barakah of time of sahur is also a gift to this ummah, that which was not given to other ummahs before. And when the time comes, take your medication, eat your food necessarily. But when it comes of your time of iftar comes, join the people for the barakah. And but most importantly, you must let your limbs fast. Your organs fast. Hold your tongue. Watch out for your eyes. Inlets into your heart. Don't listen to nonsense. Spend much time with the Quran. Yes, you are given excuse in the Sharia not to fast because you are sick. But it doesn't mean that you should not allow your limbs fast. Don't be of those people who waste their Ramadan in front of telly or in, on the internet or their whatever they are using because fasting is not just abstinence from food, drink and intimacy as Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in the hadith in Ibn Majah he says لَيْسَ لَهُ مِن صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعِ وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِن قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا السَّهْرِ Many are the ones who fast but get nothing, absolutely nothing by such fasting except hunger and thirst. And many a people perform salat by night, qiyamul layl, tarawih. They get nothing by it except the discomfort of staying awake. Why? You cannot mix poison with honey. Poison by default will take over. But you have two kilos of honey and you have only five grams of poison. Poison will always take over. What does that mean? If you let your body fast by just keeping away from food and drink, and intimacy but you do everything else so freely you still look at haram listen to haram make ghiba namima backbiting gossiping and harming people through your anger yeah although you might be fasting in the technical sense but the value of that fast in the sight of Allah is zilch. That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says there are many people who fast get nothing in terms of reward from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala except thirst and hunger. And the people who stay up all night in Salat, they go to the masjid, but their attitudes, 
The akhlaq stinks so much so that there is not a single person that they do not hurt with their words or with their actions. Such persons, they get nothing with such rewards, uh, such activity at night. Does that mean that they should stop fasting or they should uh, stop uh, going to taraweeh? No, definitely. In salat tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Salat indeed, if you're persistent on it, it will eradicate all forms of lewdness and evil within you. So you need to stop. You need to stop doing harams if you want to benefit from Ramadan. Beautify your fast by sharing your iftar with fellow Muslims. Bring that tradition in. Invite people for 30 Ramadan. Make a list next to the calendar. Imsakiya. First night, second night, third night, fourth night. Who comes to, into our house or who we go to will get invited. Just be a hasana junkie in the month of Ramadan because everything has a multiplier effect that your fard is multiplied by seven to fara'id and your nawafil is brought up to the level of the rank of fard. Try to be patient and tolerant and sympathetic, especially to your parents. To your parents. Your spouse. Your siblings. And you do this with the, with, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes an act of worship. To be kind and generous to the poor, especially our destitute Muslim brothers and sisters in our neighboring Muslim countries. To visit, give gifts, serve at least one sick person, aged person, disabled person during this month of Ramadan and never forget use every opportunity to make dua 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 for yourself asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify your inner your heart free yourself from the bad habits and the harams that you turned into a bad habit and make dua to your loved ones, your family members. And never forget to make dua for the whole of Ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For verily Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whenever a Muslim makes a dua like this, Allahumma gfir al-mu'mineen wal-mu'minat wal-muslimin wal-muslimat al-ahyai minhum wa namat bi rahmatika ya rahman rahmin Oh Allah, please Forgive all the believing men and women who are already gone, passed away, who are still present. By the millions, you're making dua for the whole Ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will give the reward equaling to the number of the people that he mentioned, all of the Ummah, into his account right there and then. A great opportunity. So in your dua, making dua to yourself, to your parents, to your siblings, to your relatives, and to your da'wah friends and brothers and sisters, and for your jama'ah, and of course, Ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and humanity at large. For their hidayah, for their guidance, for them to share this beautiful Islam with you. We said earlier, this is Shahrul Qur'an, the month of Qur'an. Let us relink our hearts with the Qur'an, stronger in this Ramadan. Some people were asking me before, they sent me a text message, what's the best way of reading Qur'an in the month of Ramadan? There are many methods, but the first thing that you should do is make the intention to make khatim of Qur'an. Complete the whole Qur'an by yourself. Depending on the speed 
with which you read. You can do one khatim, two or three or four or five, and sometimes maybe half a khatim because you're so slow. Even a quarter of a khatim that at least you started with this intention. They say everything has a beloved, a Habib. And the month of Ramadan has one beloved, that is Quran. For the duration of this month, we must dedicate a large chunk of our time to honor the Quran by reciting, by understanding. This is one particular activity, mashallah, the whole of Ummah around the globe do this. They try to complete the whole Quran reading at least once, making a khatim of Quran. I'm going to give you some steps, perhaps, to achieve this in a more practical way. First step in recitation of Quran and you want to complete the Qur'an, make a firm intention in your heart. Clarify your thoughts. Ya Rabbi, I intend to read the whole Qur'an this Ramadan. Ya Rabbi, please make it easy for me and accept it from me. You make that intention. Because in Islam, intention is the core of everything. Inna mal amalu bin niyat, says Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Actions in Islam are based by the intentions they carry for them. So, making the right intention, a proper intention, is an effective catalyst, a method for implementation of that intention, that action. Once your intention is established properly and you purified your thoughts, you must, you just did it once, no, you do it quite often. Every day before you start reading Quran, renew your intention, just to amplify it, so that it becomes an auto-suggestion to you and that you will begin to actually believe in what you're saying. Your intention, it helps your intention to stay pure. <clears throat> Even when you finished it, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from you and reiterate your initial intention. Because He knows. In Allah la yanzur ila itsamikum, wala ila suwarikum, wala kin yanzur ila kulubukum, wa amalukum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your hearts rather than your actions. The second step do not make it a big deal to yourself don't be overwhelmed for some people as much as they aspire and intend to complete the uh, recitation of the quran during ramadan they are so overwhelmed by the number of pages 600 plus pages or the length of some surahs. They say, it's too much, I can't do this, it's too big. You must remove, I can't, from your vocab first. And eliminate negative thinking. This is from shaitan and your nafs. For a real believer, true Muslim, they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah. Matched with, matched by striving with their actions. You make an effort, start the journey. Allah is the one who will take you to your destination. As Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, Niyyatul mu'min khayrun min amalihi. 
the intention of a believer is better than what he achieves with his actions. But the intention is the most important. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, inshallah, that you will achieve your goal of completing the Quran and several of them. But you need to, after making that intention, put it into action, implementation. The second view that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you capability to achieve your Quranic aspirations whether you complete one or two khatims of Quran is the key you need to believe that Allah is the one who gives success Tawfiq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who allows you to read the Quran. That's the greatest honor. But all you have to do is right intention and right action. Put your heart into this accomplishment. Set a goal. And inshallah, you will benefit from its rewards throughout Ramadan inshallah ta'ala. In a hadith narrated in both Bukhari and Muslim, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, narrates the following hadith where he says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وسلم, فَمَنْ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا If a person made the right intention and they really want to do it, they want to put it action, for some reason they made the himma, they made the ghayra, they, meet, they, they are motivated and they really made the intention in their hearts. And for some reason, events in his life or something has happened, maybe they've fallen sick or something happened in the family or some, something completely became a barrier from achieving that particular goal which you made intention for. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ عِنْدَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person cannot achieve what he intended, he could not even do a single thing of it. Because of his intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write in his book, the angels will write in the, in the, in the book of this person, a full, complete hasana, as if this person has performed that particular action. For example, you're sick, and normally you get up for tahajjud. Normally you have so much adhkar. Normally you go and visit some people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attend to sick. Normally you help around normally you attend to classes normally you do many things you do lots of quran recitation but you're sick you're in bed if you were not sick you would have done these and you might be sick for 10 days 10 months 10 years it doesn't matter you don't have the strength to do any of those because you're seriously ill comes a day of judgment in your book, you will see as if you've done all of those activities that you normally would do in your book, full hasanat, kamila, absolutely full, in perfect score, because your intention was to be with in that particular action of obedience. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to Tabuk, with his companions a battle in the north he asked people to come and join Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would normally never tell the companions where he's going until they're on the road they will get prepared for the battle but he will never tell them but this time he did and people prepared and prepared and prepared and they left 
they came to one particular place, sit down, and they're making Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, another place, same, they're making dhikr, they're with the Prophet, and they're going in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then they sit down. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, there are many people in Medina that you left behind due to sickness. They did not attend to this particular expedition. However, because of their intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also recording in their books everything that you are doing right now. Hasanat, good deeds. This is how Islam operates. How generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. The third step is to plan ahead. As the uh, cliche is, if you fail to plan, you're actually planning to fail. So everything in life has to do, work with a plan. So you can't just drift purposefully and expect to reach your destination. It doesn't work that way. Set yourself a routine, a particular time of the day that is most suitable for you to read the Qur'an that you say, as soon as the first taraweeh starts, I am going to read before I go to sleep at least half a juz, and in the morning I will read another half a juz. But you must set in concrete words that this is your goal. But you must structure a realistic goal. of how to complete your khatim of Qur'an within the month by dividing each Jews in a day. Draw up a personal plan. Review it constantly and put it into action. Many students who do cramming before the exams, they write every single minute, they plan everything and they try to stick to it. As you put your plan in onto paper, your plan to paper, consider the past Ramadans. What you did, ask yourself if there have been any instances where you were unable to complete your Khatim of Quran. Reflect over why and how this occurred, why you failed, or why you passed. Why you completed successfully? Is there a different mechanism that you could put into place to make it more effective? Yes? How, how could you enhance your daily Qur'an routine if these distractions were dealt with? Just be critically analyze your actions before that cause you to fail in completing your task. Step four, understand the Qur'an. Read, make sure that you read a little commentary or the translation of the Jews that you will be reciting daily. If you are not a master in Arabic language and you have under your belt tafsir, and tafsir, you must learn. You must learn to read in your own language. There are many available, many translations available. So you read your Quran as one activity, Tilawat al Quran, then go through the summary of the Jews that you just read. There are many available. The, the summary, what do you call the uh, the summary of his Jews that is recited in the evening in Taraweeh. There are many YouTube channels and they will give you the full Qur'an, Jews by Jews, every night. So, get your hands onto the Qur'an and study yourself. Or listen to, at least, if you cannot, I'm not a reading person very much, and listen to one of these lectures every night 
or every day so you learn exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about. You understand the gist, the themes of each surah, each chapter, each ayah, each section. Ma'ariful Qur'an is one that I highly recommend. Mufti Taqi Uthmani has translated his father's work, which was done in 10 years. It's a beautiful translation. It's about eight, nine volumes, and it's available on the internet. We can order it. Ma'arif al-Qur'an. Ma'ariful Qur'an. Or there is something even easier, Tafheem al-Qur'an by Maududi, translated into English also. So you must spend some time in the message what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you. And perhaps one more practical step, number five, find Qur'an bodies. Like at school, at university, we work better in teams. Get a couple of brothers, brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters, Qur'an bodies and compete in good. Ta'awanu ala al-birr wa taqwa as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Compete and organize and coordinate in good, not in evil. So what, for dunyawi reasons, for worldly reasons, for some projects, you help, ask each other, call each other, help each other. Yes, you do it together as a group. Why don't you do the same thing with the Qur'an? If you're such a person who works better in a group setting. Or support each other. In life, we compete with many materialistic goals. And race one another. But what about following the footsteps of the best of generations that had come before us in a competition in this Ramadan? And you must be extremely watch out, be aware of distractions. One of the most common is that we spend too much time on a artificial limb called smartphone. Way too much. The modern gadget has taken over our lives. Absolutely. We shut out the whole world and we live in some sort of virtual reality which is not a reality and we waste our capital. But Sheikh, I'm listening to YouTube and watching YouTube and learning things. You are an exception to the rule. But the majority of our youth, majority of the people who spend more time with the fitna book Instagram, Twitter, or whatever method they use, then they could ever be in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their salat, in their adhkar, in their ibadat. In Ramadan, perhaps we should minimize it if we cannot completely turn it off. There was one particular family I used to visit a lot in Ramadan when I was a university student years back, early 80s. These people are Muslims, but they were musicians. They used to play their cultural musical instruments. They used to sing. They used to have parties in their house for musical parties. So comes Ramadan, they will completely hide and bury somewhere in the house that nobody will have access to these musical instruments. Everything that resembled anything of the life in the 11 months, they will erase, cover up. So they can concentrate on Ramadan with their full heart. They will transform in such manner that 
So I, I used to say to myself, Subhanallah, what happened to these people? Completely changed. So if you want to, you can partially, if not completely, say stop to your bad habit, your addiction of social media and the like. Even if you cannot reduce it by a third, say from this hour to this hour during the day, I'm not going to use it, no matter what happens. And you will see and you will feel and you will witness the blessings in your time, inshallah ta'ala. Your heart will respond, respond to Ramadan, inshallah. Number six, seize the moment. Use every single minute as an opportunity and seize that moment. There is one particular story that I know of. There was a mother who took one of her daughters to, to see a doctor. They're waiting in the waiting room, like with everybody else. The place is full, waiting their number to come up so they can go and see the doctor. She noticed something. She noticed there was a young person, another sister. They had a small Qur'an in their hand, Mus'haf in their hand, and they were just reading. So they also waited, they were waiting for the doctor too. Sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes. They read Qur'an. Nowadays people use their Qur'an apps and they still read. But they were so determined. They, 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 she says, this was, was, this was an inspiration for me. That I was worried so much about my daughter, I couldn't do my Qur'an recitation. I had to bring her to doctor and what have you because she couldn't sleep last night. Now, I saw that even in adverse conditions, a person can seize the moment and utilize it to its benefit. Utilize that time for your own benefit. So get one of those Qur'ans if you don't have smartphone app on Qur'an. And read the translation. But utilize your heart. Occupy your heart in with the activity that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single moment can be as such. Seize the opportunity. Seize the moment. One of the best times to recite the Qur'an is Sahur time. Wake up a little bit early. While mum, your parents are preparing food. Sahur, that you must partake and leave it as delayed as possible. Because Sahur is barakah, a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this ummah. You pray your tahajjud first and sit down and read your Qur'an. Once you develop that good habit of reciting Qur'an, inshallah, you'll be so shocked and so amazed that even after Ramadan, because it's a month of training of tahajjud even, after Ramadan, these good habits that you have acquired, both Salat, tahajjud, as well as Qur'an, continue with you, inshallah ta'ala. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our ummah in the early hours of the morning. And he will also be more likely to memorize surahs, ayats of the Qur'an at this time. And research shows that morning study creates better performance in students so don't miss the moment of the morning, morning recitation. Or you can read after each Salat, four pages, five times a day, 
4 times 5 is 20, one juice. You can do it. Easy. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes even. And if you were to include tahajjud, then even reduce the numbers to three pages. You still can do it. Be recite a couple of pages of Quran again, part of your juz, before you go into sleep. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna nashi'ata layli hiya ashaddu wat'an wa aqwamu qila. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Indeed, the hours of the night are more effective for concurrence and more suitable for words. That quietness, stillness of the night is very special night. Special time. Reciting during the day is also beneficial, of course. However, the nighttime recitation is easier as well as during Ramadan as there are less distractions and noise. Seventh step is have istiqrar. Be consistent and steadfast. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says the best deed in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is that is which is small but it is done regularly. The key to any success is in life consistency. A student can never finish his course, university, if he's not consistent. You cannot keep a job if you're not consistent. So consistency is the key. A Muslim is always consistent. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day because that is very important for us as Muslims. Number eight, Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we say, nothing can be achieved without the nusra, without the awn, without the tawfiq, without the help and assistance and guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you made your intention to complete the Quran al kareem your khatim or your memorization of Quran, make dua first. Allahumma bil haqqi anzaltahu wa bil haqqi nazal. اللهم أظلم رغبتي فيه وجعله نورا لبصري وشفاء لصدري اللهم زين به لساني وجمل به وجهي وقوي به جسدي وارزقني تلاوته عنا وارزقني تلاوته عنا الليل وأطراف النهار وحشرني مع النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم وآل أخيار نوينا قراءة القرآن لرضاء الرحمن وتنوير قبور أهل الإيمان وروح الشمس سيد الأنبياء وقم المرسلين سيدنا محمد على الصلوات الرحمن وطرد الشيطان وإسقاط الذنوب وقبل التوبة ورفع الدرجات والنجاة من النيران وبقاء الإيمان ولقاء الرحمن برحمتك يا رحمن الرحمين Or any other dua that comes from your heart, read it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to achieve your goal. So these are the eight ways I want to share with you on starting and completing the journey through recitation of the Holy Quran in this Ramadan. For verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Elif Lameem, Thalika al-Kitab, La Rayba Fi, Hudan lil Muttaqi. This is the book about which there is not a single doubt. It is a guidance for those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the month of taqwa training, this is the book, one activity that you can really concentrate amongst many other activities. As final reminders, I'd like to remind myself and you a few more points during Ramadan, inshallah. As we said, you must plan your Ramadan schedule. Don't waste time in Ramadan. Put some goals that you can achieve and that you can track your progress in achieving them. 
like citation of Quran we said, increasing your sadaqah, and perhaps smiling more to the Muslims around you. Make sure that you don't start off too hard, too quickly in the first few days. The last thing that you want is to burn out from the beginning. Organizing your Ramadan schedule early helps to prevent this particular burnout. Be mindful of assignments and exams that you might have during Ramadan. Be quick to break your iftar. Do not delay your iftar. Break it on time. But delay your suhoor as much as possible to the last, last 15 to 20 minutes. As possible. For this was the tradition, the sunnah of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As long as my ummah breaks his fast on time, he says, they shall remain. They shall remain. The barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to come onto them. Or don't say, oh, when I go home, I'll break my fast. No. Just for the sake of breaking on time with a sip of water. You don't have to eat. Maybe one date, but break it on time. And make sure that you get up for suhoor. Don't say, I'm going to eat uh, at night early, 12 o'clock. I don't want to break my sleep, so I don't want to get up until Fajr. No. You get up. That's part of the training of getting up for sahur that you also get trained for tahajjud. Taqwa training. The masjid. When we go to the masjid, we must attend, of course. We must also follow the adab, conduct, mannerism of the masjid. We should, not, we should be respectful towards other Tuyufur Rahman, guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Allah's house. By following certain practical issues, suggestions, for example, your parking. Don't be selfish. Park your car properly. Do not Disturb the neighbors. Do not block their driveways. Do not ever cause any harm to fellow Muslim. Oh, as soon as Salah finishes, I'm going to. It doesn't work. Park your car a little bit far and walk. Because for every single step, you get a hasanat. For every single step, one of your sins are deleted. For every single step, Allah elevates you, your position, your rank in His sight. When during Taraweeh, be mindful of your adab, I said, because Malaika also congregating amongst us. They're also joining us in Salat and prayer. And let us not disturb the Malaika and the fellow Muslims with bad odor of our mouth during Ramadan. In Iftar, don't eat too foul and garlic smelling foods. It's against the sunnah in the first place when you go into the masjid. When you, somebody burps next to you, another person faints, this should not be so ever. Yes, you ate your favorite food, but you need to consider what is ahead because you're going to go to the masjid. But after you come back from masjid, you'll be at home, eat as much as you want. Not a problem. As spicy as possible. Not a problem. Be dressed for the occasion, as if you're going to a wedding, you're going to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a neat and clean attire that is comfortable and presentable in front of your Lord. And never, and never, ever despair that He is near you. He is always indeed near. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِمْ in Hablil Warid. We are closer to you than your own jugular veins. We are with you wherever you are, especially in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you made mistakes in your ibadat, in your prayers, in the masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive and accept it from you. 
But the moment that you begin to disturb his other guests with your behavior, with your smell, with uh, stinking uh, socks and you name it, then you're offending others, then Allah subhanahu will be angry with you. Inshallah, I want to say a few more things, but our time is up tomorrow, 5.30. For two hours, inshallah, we will concentrate on the technical fuqhi aspects of fasting, what are permissible, what are not permissible, what breaks fast, what does not break fast, when do we have to pay kafara, and all the permutations and combinations of questions we will try to answer according to Hanafi School of Thought, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, subhanaka Allahumma wa hamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, wahdaka la sharika lak, nasdahu firuka wa natubi lak. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان في خسر إلى الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your patience. Forgive me for my shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa taala accept our efforts and purify our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa taala insha Allah keep us on sirat al mustaqim with your loved ones insha Allah taala. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.